typical man, 40-year-old Stephen Griffiths, a mature student, and charged him with the murder of the three women. He appeared at Bradford Magistrates Court and is currently on remand while investigations continue. The three women, Shelley Armitage, Suzanne Blameyes and Susan Rushworth, vanished from the streets where they worked over the past year. Only two of the bodies have been found so far. Their disappearances have brought back memories of the Yorkshire Ripper. Peter Sutcliffe murdered 13 women and attacked several others in the same area before he was finally caught. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in 1981 and is now held at Broadmoor Hospital. His was one of the crimes that shook the world. January 1981. The biggest manhunt in police history comes to an end. The police have arrested 34-year-old Peter Sutcliffe, the serial killer dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper. The first blow that felled me. Then there was four more blows after that. In five years, Sutcliffe brutally murdered 13 women. <laughs> the skull, when you touched it, you could feel that there were multiple fractures all over the place. He claimed he was on a divine mission. He was adamant that God had given him this mission to rid the world of prostitutes. Seemingly eluding the police at will. He kept giving us the slip, and he was always one step ahead of us. This is the extraordinary story of how Britain's most notorious serial killer was finally caught. This man brought fear to the whole of this community. Leeds, 1975. The unidentified body of a woman is discovered in a playing field in the heart of the city. It's the fourth suspected prostitute murder the police have dealt with that year. But this one's different. There's something about the injuries that worries forensic pathologist Professor Mike Green. The overriding feature was a single blow or two blows to the back of the head, round about here. And then once the patient is immobilized, uh, other injuries were inflicted. These were stab wounds. They were an unusual shape. But what was particularly unusual was that all of these wounds showed reinsertion. <laughs> and this is one of the many things that makes this case so different from your typical homicide. I certainly have never seen another case like it, and I don't think many people will have. The body is identified as 28-year-old Wilma McCann. She lived just 100 yards from the playing field where her body was found. The memory of that day still haunts her son, Richard. This police officer sat us down, and I'll never forget those words. Your mum's been taken to heaven. You're not going to see her again. And as a, as a five-year-old boy, yeah, I was, I was devastated. We worked out over the next few weeks that she'd been attacked at the back of the house on that field. Alarmed by the savagery of the attack, the West Yorkshire Police launch an all-out investigation. But Wilma McCann's killer remains elusive. Twelve weeks later, another body turns up in the back streets of Leeds. A letter inside the woman's bag identifies her as 42-year-old Emily Jackson. Pathologist Mike Green notes a disturbing pattern beginning to form. By the time you're on to the second case, the similarities began to emerge again. There is a head injury, there are injuries to the abdomen, and, of course, occupational similarity, uh, a woman who is uh, a working girl, as they say. 
The failure to find the killer concerns Keith Halliwell, a chief inspector in the West Yorkshire Police. Our murder detection rate had been as high, if not higher, than most other forces in the country. There were years when we'd no outstanding or unsolved murders. And here was one murder, then another murder, that wasn't being solved. And as far as the police were concerned, there was utter frustration. The press sees upon the similarities between the two murders. Constable Andrew Laptew is there when the police find the first clue to the identity of the killer. Emily Monica Jackson was found at the rear of a, a bakery. We actually saw the, the body with a, a Wellington boot print across one of her thighs, which was quite uh, a vivid sight. More boot prints are found in the soil near the body. Forensic experts set about analysing them. They took the casts of these marches in Plaster of Paris. What they realised was they could give an idea of the size of the footwear that had left this mark. They had a tread pattern that they could work from. When the forensic team discovers that the print belongs to a size 7 workman's boot, they suspect the killer may be a manual worker. For a year, no more bodies turn up. The trail turns cold, and talk of a serial killer stops. Any ideas on where we can go? It's to be the lull before the storm. Two women have been found murdered in disturbingly similar ways in the city of Leeds. The press suspect the deaths are the work of a serial killer. Despite an intensive police investigation, the attacker remains as elusive as ever. It's now been a year since the last body was discovered. Theories about a serial killer appear unfounded. That is all about to change. Round Hay Park, a green oasis on the northern edge of Leeds. On February the 5th, 1977, the tranquility of the park is shattered. You all right there, love? Come on, how long is this going to take? Pathologist Mike Green, the wounds are worryingly similar to the two earlier murders. By the time we were on to the third one, again, head injury, injuries to the abdomen, so a definite series has emerged by then. The worst fears of the police are confirmed. A serial killer is at work. The senior officers that were involved in the early stages of the case um, put two and two together and because of the, uh, the method of, a, of the victims being attacked, i.e. the hitting on the head with a, a hammer and then subsequently the stabbing, multiple stabbings, it became evident that it was the work of one person. The dead woman is named as 28-year-old Irene Richardson. Marks in the mud around the body reveal another disturbing twist to the murder. Whoever had done it 
put himself in the position of the first person coming round the corner and almost like a film or television producer you could imagine him framing his shot and saying no that's not quite right let's go and spread the legs a little bit foot more and you could see the drag marks on the ground where the body had been rearranged at least twice possibly three times for maximum effect there wasn't just arrangement of the body, there was arrangement of the possessions. The boots had been neatly arranged across the legs. The contents of the handbag had been neatly arranged to one side. A careful search of the area reveals something the killer didn't mean to leave behind. Tire tracks. The police quickly draw up a list of the hundred makes of car that use the same tires. The police start tracking down the 53,000 car owners of these different models. Despite contacting over 30,000 owners, no new information emerges. The search is called off. It's a sickening blow to the police. We were pretty depressed really because there were all these murders and attacks happening uh, and we weren't really getting anywhere despite the massive effort and work that had been put into the inquiry. After three deaths, the police were no nearer catching the murderer. Yet 18 months earlier, they'd been handed a description of an assailant whose method of attack matched the killers. Walking home, 14-year-old schoolgirl Tracy Brown is approached by a man. It just seemed very unassuming, and I wasn't aware that I should fear, have any fear with this person. And I didn't feel that I was in a dangerous situation with him. What happened next still haunts Tracy over three decades later. I just felt like a dull thud. There was no pain. It was that hard, it was not me senseless. And, um, and it just felled me. And um, I was just on the ground and uh, it was hitting me again. I didn't even panic, I just remember just saying, oh, stop, please, just stop. Disturbed by a passing car, Tracy's attacker runs off. Despite spending over a week in hospital, Tracy is able to give police a clear description of her attacker. He had dark Afroy style hair, um, a really dark full beard, swirly complexion, very dark eyes, almost black eyes. Even with the photo fit, the police can't find a convincing suspect. In the spring of 1977, the body of a fourth woman is discovered. There is another savage variation to the murder. We're now in Oak Avenue, and this is a, a murder scene where Patricia Atkinson was murdered. It was something totally unusual, a total departure from his usual killing methods. <laughs> it's the first time a body has been found indoors and the attack shows a disturbing escalation of violence. The head injuries were infinitely more severe. <laughs> the skull underneath the skin was the classical bag of marbles skull, as it's called in pathology. When you touched it, you could feel that there were multiple fractures all over the place. On the bed sheets of Patricia Atkinson's flat, the police discover a bloody boot print. 
It's a good match for the prints found at the murder scene of Emily Jackson. But no other evidence turns up. In 18 months, the killer has taken the lives of four women and left 13 children motherless. The police make 2,300 house inquiries and take over 2,000 statements, all to no avail. Nine weeks later, the body of 16-year-old Jane MacDonald is discovered in a playground. Her death will completely alter the public perception of the killings. For me, and also for a lot of society, when he killed Jay MacDonald, I think that's when it changed, because this was an apparent innocent victim. They were all innocent, as far as I'm concerned, but, you know, the police and the media were suggesting that because of a 16-year-old girl, this man would kill anybody. News of Jane MacDonald's murder spreads alarm throughout the North. This man brought fear to the whole of this community. And because we didn't know who, who this was, because we didn't know where he would strike, everybody was frightened. Following Jane MacDonald's murder, Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield is appointed head of the entire investigation. His first act is to bring all the information about the five murders under one roof. The volume of information gathered is enormous. Oldfield sets about trying to cross-reference all the evidence. Right, you lot. Listen. All of you need to get much more detailed statements. And I want to see everything recorded onto index cards. Get on with it. But the index card system proves inadequate to cope with so much data. As barrister for the prosecution, Harry Ognall recalls. They had so many tons of paper there that they actually had to reinforce the floor to take the weight. So the first thing to be said is that they were inundated with a surfeit of information and they had no means effectively and efficiently of coordinating it. Information overload is a problem that will continue to dog the inquiry. The killer's sixth victim is found in an allotment near a cemetery in Manchester. The body is identified as 20-year-old Jean Jordan. The forensic team make a crucial breakthrough. Fly eggs are found in the wounds. Now, there are some flies who prefer to lay their eggs in the shade, and some flies prefer to lay their eggs in bright sunlight. And in what you might call the sunny side of the body, there were eggs that preferred shade told the police that this body had lain for two or three days completely shaded and had then been pulled out into the light. The police deduce the killer has returned to the body to find something he's left behind. The search around the body intensifies. In a neighboring garden, a handbag is found. In a hidden pocket, there's a brand new five pound note police believe that five pound note must have been given or could have been given by her murderer. Tracing the five pound note from the Bank of England to Yorkshire, the police come up with a list of 35 firms that could have included the note in their payroll. One of them is T and W H Clark, an engineering haulage company. The workplace of lorry driver Peter Sutcliffe. As a possible recipient of the five-pound note, 
the police interview Sutcliffe. We're going to run past where Peter Sutcliffe used to live. This is the house where he used to live with his wife, Sonia. The police ask Sutcliffe what he was doing the night Jean Jordan was killed. We had a party here that night. I remember because I ended up dropping a few people back home. That's right, isn't it? You remember that, don't you? Yes. Sutcliffe was to reveal later why the police so readily accepted his alibi. This is where Sutcliffe got away literally by the skin of his teeth. He was about the 400th person who was interviewed by the police that weekend. And as he said in his interview afterwards, they were so tired that I could have told them anything and they would have believed it. The failure of the five pound note inquiry ends in tragedy. Less than six months after Sutcliffe's interview, the bodies of Yvonne Pearson and Helen Ritker are found. In May of that year, his ninth victim is named as 40-year-old Vera Millwood. The press dubbed the killer the Yorkshire Ripper. The manhunt for the Ripper is stepped up. A covert operation noting number plates of cars that frequent red light areas begins. The police are looking for cars that are spotted in two or more districts. One name keeps cropping up. Sutcliffe had been sighted in the red light areas three times in Leeds, once in Manchester, and numerous times in Bradford, in excess of 70 sightings in Bradford. Here again. I would offer you a seat. But... Give us a minute, will you, love? How many times do I have to tell you? I drive through the centre of Bradford on my way home. And I haven't been to Leeds in ages. I've no reason to. So, if you don't mind. Not happy with Sutcliffe's answers, the police schedule a follow-up interview. But when the body of Building Society clerk, Josephine Whitaker, turns up, the interview's cancelled. The red light operation seems to have backfired. Police activity was so intense that uh, he would have been spotted in the red light area, so I decided to select his victims elsewhere, away from the red light areas. Forensics analysis of the Whitaker murder scene uncovers a boot print. A worn down area on the right boot suggests the wearer could be a long distance driver. It's another clue pointing to Sutcliffe as the Ripper. But when a seemingly vital piece of evidence is handed to the police, they're to be led down a different path with tragic consequences. strawberries and cream ice cream made from Cornish cream and strawberries simple pleasure the results are in it's won good housekeeping's beauty star award in style calls it the affordable Lux cream Grazia says it's the 30 pound American dream cream and more importantly women are seeing results noticeable results Regenerous 3-Point Treatment Cream. 
get younger looking skin without drastic measures. Olay, love the skin you're in. Welcome to my world. Won't you come on in? It's not too late to book your perfect summer holiday. Thompson Holidays, built with you in mind. Be prepared and keep your legs perfectly smooth. Now with essential oils, new Veet Supreme Essence Wax Strips. Simply warm, peel, apply and remove. Then wipe for luxuriously smooth skin that lasts up to four weeks. Discover the smoothness of Supreme Essence. Veet, what beauty feels like. And Veet wax strips are so easy to use, 88% of Glamour readers recommend them. I was a lady once, or was it twice? <laughs> Morning! Hello. My young lady friend here would like a savings account. I've just turned 18. But it has to be suitable for ladies. We are both ladies, you see. Right. Uh, how about our unique champion saver? It is suitable for ladies and men. Every month we select the five highest branch-based rates from a group of eight high street banks. Oh, how enchanting! <laughs> then take the average and add a bonus for a top rate. Sounds divine. I'll take it. Your name, please. Fred Brown. <laughs> Get a top rate month after month with Nationwide's champion saver. Sorry, Emily. You ruined it. What do you get at the end of a week? A weekend. There are boys' ones. <laughs> Girls' ones. <laughs> and dirty ones. Whatever your weekend, make the most of it. Hey. With king-size beds, hundreds of city locations and on-site restaurants. From just £29, make your weekend a premier weekend. <laughs> premier Inn. Everything's premier but the price. A small house would cost you about a hundred pounds. Helicopter costs trillion and fifty. Ele ele eleven pounds. Eleven pounds. It's lucky Mum's good with money. She knows the KFC bargain bucket, eight pieces of original recipe chicken, and four fries is only nine ninety nine. The sports channels, a couple of quid a month. The KFC bargain bucket, only nine ninety nine. Charlotte has an undiagnosed form of primordial dwarfism. Age two, she weighs the same as an average newborn baby. I dressed my sister in my dolly's clothes. What will the future hold for the world's tiniest girl? Extraordinary People, next Monday at 9 on 5. In less than four years, the killer dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper has claimed the lives of ten women. The police have launched Britain's biggest manhunt. Lorry driver Peter Sutcliffe has been interviewed four times in connection with the killings. Is the net finally closing in on the Yorkshire Ripper? In June 1979, the head of the Ripper investigation, George Oldfield, receives a tape recording from a man claiming to be the killer. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. With the voice having an accent from the northeast of England, the suspect is dubbed Wearside Jack. A crucial decision has to be made. Do we believe this is the man and we go full pelt for it? Or do we think it is some hoaxer that, you know, we just sort of ignore it and play it down? We've been waiting four years for him to do something stupid. And now he's done it. If this bugger thinks he can send us a tape, taking the mick out of us and get away with it, then he's very much mistaken. So the decision was, we go with it, and if we go with it, we go with it firmly, and we go with it positively. And that's what, what George did. 
the accent becomes a key part of the killer's profile. This is the elimination criteria. Shoe size 9 or less, blood group B. And he lives, or works, in Yorkshire. But there is no doubt, he's a Geordie. Armed with the tape, the police begin a nationwide publicity campaign. One of the most powerful memories that I have of that era was when West Yorkshire Police received that cassette recording. My name's Jack, you're no nearer to catching me now than you were four years ago when I started. I heard that in a club one night and, and I thought, my God, that's, that's the man that killed my mum. That's the man that I, I think's gonna kill me. And that chilling recording has remained with me ever since. Briefed to take special note of the person's accent, the police begin a series of follow-up interviews. Andrew Laptu is sent to question Peter Sutcliffe. We told him what the nature of our business was. He invited us into his lounge. I don't know why you keep bothering us. My mates at work have even started calling me Ripper. I'm getting sick of it. One of the icebreakers we used at that particular time was uh, to Sonia. Now's your chance to get rid of your husband if you want. Normally we get a reaction, a laugh, something like that. But from uh, both Peter Sutcliffe and Sonia, there, were, there was no comment, no reply, nothing, not a laugh. I thought it was a bit strange. Get us a cup of tea, will you? As we continued our interview, we sort of started developing ill feelings about Peter Sutcliffe, uh, that it just didn't seem right. Very cagey, very unresponsive. Listen, I don't use prostitutes. I never have. Why would I? When we sort of started thinking about it in some depth, a uh, certain alarm bell started ringing, i.e. his general appearance, which completely fitted the photo fit. The shoe size fitted footprints that were found at uh, scenes of crime. His firm, WH Clarks at Shipley, were featured in the five pound note inquiry. Laptew writes up his report and takes it to his commanding officer. He is stunned by the reaction. He summarily dismissed it. I was gutted, absolutely gutted. Uh, not so much because I've been rejected, but the way I had been rejected, that I'd been made to look pretty stupid. Uh, and that was the hurtful part. The biggest factor which went to negating my report, I assume was because he wasn't a Geordie. He didn't have the Geordie accent. Not everybody is convinced the voice is that of the Ripper. George Oldfield came over to the farm and played this tape. And, um, and I just remember listening to that and said, no, it's not him. As much as I tried to tell him it was a Yorkshire accent, he was actually focused on this guy being a Geordie guy. And he was getting a little bit frustrated himself because I, I just thought that I wasn't telling him what he wanted to hear. With Sutcliffe excluded from the inquiries, it's not long before another body turns up. On the 2nd of September, 1979, the killer strikes again. This area is Backash Grove, where Barbara Leach, a student at Bradford University, was found. She was assaulted, stabbed, and then dumped in a niche normally reserved for dustbins in this back alley. Another blameless victim. It's a devastating setback for the police. When you're a police officer, 
Uh, and when you support the community, you love that community. You're, you're worried, you're part of it. So it was pain, shared pain, um, and it, it was terrible. Pressure mounts on West Yorkshire police to call in outside help. George, why don't we call in the yard? New Scotland Yard? Those useless buggers haven't caught their own ripper yet. Go on, lad. Get yourself home. For George Oldfield, the enormous responsibility is taking its toll. The masses of information that was coming up to him was, was extraordinary, and not, one individual couldn't cope with that. I think he was, he was sort of up 24 hours a day dealing with this. With the investigation in disarray, Oldfield is removed as head of the Ripper Squad, and the Wearside Jack tapes are finally discredited as a hoax. In August and November of 1980, the Ripper claims his 12th and 13th victims, civil servant Marguerite Walls and student Jacqueline Hill. Six of the best minds in British policing are brought in to shake up the inquiry. They become known as the Ripper Super Squad. One of the key members of the squad is forensic expert Professor Stuart Kind. Using skills he learned as an RAF navigator, Kind creates an entirely new technique to track down the Ripper. By cross-referencing the location with the time of each attack, Kind pinpoints the most likely place the killer comes from as Bradford, the town where Peter Sutcliffe lives. Kind's geographical profiling takes the police one step closer to Sutcliffe. But will the Yorkshire Ripper be caught before he kills again? On the 2nd of January, 1981, Sergeant Robert Ring and PC Robert Hydes make a routine check of an area used by prostitutes. What's your name? John Williams. Where are you from, Mr. Williams? Rotherham. Who's she? My girlfriend. What's her name? I don't know. I, I haven't known her that long. Are you trying to kid? Do I look like a fallen off a Christmas tree? Wait here. When the registration plate is checked, the details fail to match the car or driver. Those plates belong on a Skoda, and you don't look very much like a Mr. Khan. I'm going to place you both under arrest. You get out. You stay there, love. Wait! Where do you think you're going? Come back here! I need the toilet. We can go to the toilet over here, where I can keep an eye on you. Forget it. They took him to the uh, police station where they began to suspect. They, they thought that maybe this chap isn't just uh, a punter. He, he could be the Yorkshire Ripper. The following day, Sutcliffe is questioned by the Ripper squad. I gave three people a lift. They offered me £10 to take him home, so I did. So only when I got to Sheffield, I decided to use the money to go with a prostitute. I thought you said you'd never been with a prostitute. I didn't mean... What I meant was... I didn't want to have sex with her. I just wanted to talk about the problems I'm having at home. You're telling me you've never had sex with a prostitute? How many times? 
Sutcliffe's appearance, shoe size, and where he lives all match the suspect's profile. But without solid proof, Sutcliffe will be released on bail. Will the Yorkshire Ripper once again evade capture? Get out. You stay ill. After he's caught with a prostitute on the outskirts of Sheffield, Peter Sutcliffe is questioned by the Ripper squad. It was only when I got back to Sheffield that I decided to use the money to go with a prostitute. It's the tenth time he's been interviewed in relation to the killings. But unless they find hard evidence, the police will have to let Sutcliffe go. When Sergeant Robert Ring hears the man he arrested the night before is still being questioned by the Ripper squad, he decides to follow a hunch. Remembering Sutcliffe had slipped away for a few seconds, he returns to search the area. It proves to be a crucial decision. The police confront Sutcliffe with their findings. I think you've been leading up to it. Leading up to what? The Yorkshire Ripper. What about the Yorkshire Ripper? It's me. Sutcliffe told me that at that moment, miraculously, God told me I had to tell the truth, my mission was over. That's Sutcliffe's version of it. I just want to tell you about what I've done. I'm glad it's all over. Suddenly all of this pressure was lifted, all of the... Um, all of the feelings were released, you know, finally, finally, this has come to an end. And it didn't matter how it came to an end. This man was caught, and finally the chat was an end. So there was euphoria. When I first heard that Peter Sutcliffe was a Yorkshire Ripper, it's very difficult to describe how I, I actually felt. But it was like being punched in the heart, to be honest. The fact that I had interviewed Sutcliffe and that he had gone on to kill and injure other victims was something that is, is going to live with me and stay with me to my grave. The public can finally vent their fury at the murderer. A man has been arrested in connection with the Yorkshire Ripper murders. He's been named as Peter Sutcliffe and lorry driver. People were outraged and enraged, and their, their um, emotions were boiling over outside the court in the streets. On the 29th of April, 1981, the trial of Sutcliffe starts at the Old Bailey. Despite confessing to the killings, Sutcliffe enters a plea of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Sutcliffe's thesis, if I can call it that, was that having had uh, an experience in a, a Bingley cemetery when looking at a, a gravestone of a dead Polish person, he'd had this message from God which in fact conferred upon him a divine mission to kill prostitutes. <laughs> Those involved with the case offer another reason why Sutcliffe killed. I think that his motive for causing the deaths of these women were for his own sexual gratification. I think it's the only way he could get any form of sexual satisfaction. I'm going to need you to take your clothes off. Forensics need them. The belief Sutcliffe is a sexual predator is further supported with the recent revelation about a strange undergarment he was wearing at the time of his arrest. What the hell are those? 
leg warmers. Made from a V-neck sweater, Sutcliffe's bizarre leggings were designed to protect his knees and leave his genital area uncovered. Because this garment, as I understand it, would have powerfully demonstrated that uh, he was minded when he'd assaulted and in some cases, many cases, killed his victims, he would masturbate over their body. The trial of the Yorkshire Ripper lasts for 14 days. Dismissing Sutcliffe's claims of diminished responsibility, the jury find him guilty of 13 cases of murder. Sutcliffe is handed 20 life sentences. I think everybody in the country wanted this guy to, to be convicted, for this guy to go down for a long time. And I suspect the majority of people, in this, in, certainly in Yorkshire, would have liked him hanged. Uh, that would have been my feeling. I believe he should have been hanged. For the police, the elation at the verdict doesn't last long. A report looking at the five-year Ripper manhunt paints a damning picture of the investigation. There was this feeling of immense sorrow that some of our senior colleagues who had put their hearts and souls and their physical health so completely into the inquiry were simply butchered to uh, satisfy the press. The Home Office report effectively ends George Oldfield's police career. Less than two years after his retirement, Oldfield dies, aged just 61 years old. Three decades later, the effects of Sutcliffe's brutality are still being felt. Why did he do it to me? What was going through his head? How did he feel? Does he feel any remorse about what he's done? Not only to me, but about all these other people as well. Or is it just nothing inside there? Is it just totally bad and evil? I've seen how it's affected my, my family and um, my siblings, and my eldest sister, Sonia, especially. She felt that she didn't deserve to live to be older than my mum. At 28, mum died. Um, and when Sonia became 28, she, it's almost like she got even worse because she didn't feel like she deserved to live. And, and very sadly, to say the least, Sonia took her life. Um, in December, just gone last Christmas, and uh, you know, I put that down to what he did, Peter Sutcliffe, on, on the night Mum died. In 2006, 50 year old John Humble admitted to sending the hoax tapes. He was sentenced to eight years for perverting the course of justice. Peter Sutcliffe later confessed to Keith Halliwell the attack on Tracy Brown. In 1984, Sutcliffe was transferred to Broadmoor Secure Mental Hospital, where he's still held today.